Hallelujah. How's everybody tonight? Can we lower this just a little? Praise God. That way I can yell without throwing anybody off their chair. Yo! Glory. Okay, we're good. Hallelujah. Another beautiful night in God's neighborhood. <laughs> God is good all the time. I'm telling you, he is good all the time. Yep, yep, yep. Are you ready? You know, one of the things we need to ask ourselves all the time, am I ready to go home? Amen. Not because you're going through stuff. Hello? Amen. <laughs> A lot of people are ready. I can't wait to go home. I, you know, forget. <laughs> I'm talking about are you ready to go home? That means are you ready to stand before the king? <laughs> A lot of people can't say yes. Because there's, there's th things still hidden in your life, especially behind closed doors, you don't want to stand before the king. But if you're only considering that about going home, standing before the king, then you really don't have a relationship. Because we're to stand before the king every day. Amen? And we're to put him before us, aren't we? And everything we do. Again, I can only emphasize the reality and the importance of staying connected to the presence of God and staying in alignment with his word. Vital importance. Vital. At Matthew 17, would you go there with me, please? Matthew 17. In Matthew 17, 1 through 8, we're going to read. Now, I want you to understand that we are in such a prophetic time and things are unfolding so quickly, it's hard to keep up. In verse 1, it says, Now after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John and his brother, led them up on the high mountains by themselves. Now, I want you to understand that the word says, A day with the Lord is equal to a thousand years. So this is a prophetic moment. Why? Because something is going to happen with God, with Jesus. So he's talking about something that's going to happen after 6,000 years. We've already reached that. We're after 6,000 years. And he says, and he, in verse 2, and he was what? Transfigured before them, his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as light. In other words, after 6,000 years, there's going to be an event where we're going to change in a twinkling of an eye. And behold, verse 3, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with him. Then Peter answered and said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, let us make here three tabernacles for you one for Moses and one for Elijah. Now, grab hold of this because these are two prophets, prophetic individuals. And in this, he's talking about the removal, the exodus of the church, the body of Christ, those who are righteous, because there is a big sign in front of the throne room of God. It says justice and righteousness, and it's in every language. So you can't get in unless you're associated with that. So in this, these prophetic individuals showed up with Jesus. Amen? Amen? And then they said, let us make three tabernacles after 6,000 years. Well, I want you to grab hold of this because the third temple is going to be built soon, representing the tabernacle. And this will be built in Jerusalem. That's why the U.S. Embassy is moving to Jerusalem. Not only proclaiming that Jerusalem is Israel's capital, but so that they can help prepare the third temple. Does everybody get it? Again, this is a prophetic moment here. In verse 5, Now while he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and suddenly a voice came out 
of the cloud saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their faces and were greatly afraid. But Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise and do not be afraid. When they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus in his carnal form, in his human form. Amen? Again, six days represents after 6,000 years which we have already entered, there'll be a transfiguration event which will occur where the body of Christ will put on immortality. Amen? The body of Christ will put on immortality. Moses and Elijah will appear as the two prophets in Israel. And they will be warning mankind of the wrath of God to come, offering salvation, or what we might say, exodus. Before the wrath. Again, what a prophetic events that are, these are all prophetic events that are taking place. Talking about the third temple in Jerusalem and so forth. That's why Trump uh, required that we move over there, put our embassy over there. Two of God's prophets have gone home. The last one of God's prophets was Billy Graham. One of the major individuals that have affected the world. He is considered a Moses. Oral Roberts is another one who is considered an Elijah. Signs and wonders and miracles followed Oral Roberts. Salvation followed Billy Graham. These two individuals have gone home. That means two other prophets have to replace them. And that will most likely be Elijah and Moses in due time. Does everybody understand? Yeah. Amen. Now, one of the things about what's happening even right now, before the exodus with Moses, he had to battle in the courts of Pharaoh. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Well, right now... <laughs> Trump is bailing in the courts of Pharaoh. <laughs> and that's happening with Supreme Courts, changing out judges, removing immoral laws. Laws that are against God. In fact, they're trying to remove the abortion law, even now. And he wants to replace them with laws that are pleasing or approved by God. Again, we are not in a fight of humanity. We are in a fight between another race, mankind, in an unseen realm. In other words, our battle is against the Nephilim leaders that have infiltrated all of our governments and political arenas. They are what they also call globalists. They want one world, one world order because they promote a Luciferian agenda. God wants to invade all of these things. In fact, there was a testimony of a gentleman that's involved in the elite Illuminati who knows them very well. And they even know because their 16 plan got interrupted. And they've even testified in saying God did a divine intervention and prevented them. They stopped them. So now they've got to go a whole nother route. They said it may take years for them to re try to re come around again to take down the country because that's their purpose. But you got to remember also that right now they're, they've already celebrated the crowning of Apollyon. Amen. Their king, who is actually Satan. God again wants to return prosperity back to his people. The left and the Democratic Party. In liberal uh, parties, they promote the Luciferian agenda. Again, they sacrifice their children. They're inv involved in perversion inside. They promote their agenda is abortion, which is murder. Amen. They promote same-sex marriage, which is perversion. And God's not appreciating that. Now, Elijah battled Jezebel and Ahab. 
And these spirits that we're still battling now, the two major judges of Bill and Ahab's is Bill and Hillary Clinton. They are the Jezebel re regime right now that there is a battle. This is a global battle that Satan's kingdom is using. Remember, United States is associated with the center of this world as the major country that reaches out with the gospel of truth. It is the most human humanitarian humanitarian outreach in the world. And the enemy is trying to destroy everything he can with this country. But God said no. Again, there was wrath coming on this country, judgment. Now, don't get me wrong, there is judgment in the house of God right now. Yeah. Why is there judgment in the house of God? Because too many so-called believers are approving of the things that God is displeased in. In Jeremiah 31, and who were those two prophets? Moses and Elijah. Elijah. You know, God always leaves a remnant and witness. In Jeremiah 31, in verse 27. It says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will sow the house of Israel and the house of Judah with the seed of man and the seed of the beast or the seed of the serpent. It shall come to pass that I, will, I have watched over them to pluck up and to break down and to throw down, to destroy and to afflict. So I will watch over them to build and to plant, says the Lord. In those days they shall say no more, the fathers have eaten sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set on edge. But every one shall die for his own iniquity. Every man who eats the sour grapes, his teeth shall be set on edge. Again, the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent, the sour grapes are not considered purple. That means eating false doctrines. That's false doctrines. It's a Luciferian uh, uh, color in that arena. Promoting a Luciferian agenda. In other words, in the political, ju in the judi judicial, and educational, social media, websites, news, movies. There's a lot of false prophets. There's wolves in sheep's clothing, uh, which brings a veil of deception and blindness to the truth of reality and prevents people from escaping. Amen? Or missing the exodus. And what are they escaping? Eternal separation from, from God, you know, our, our Lord, and never able to connect, or even some of them have become disconnected from God's presence because of this doctrine that they are following. Again, to overcome, we must maintain an alignment with the Word of God and connection to the presence of God. I can't emphasize this enough. And how many times I see people get disconnected and go back to the world. And if you're so easily swayed not to become or get involved in fellowship to be connected, then you're dangerous. Amen? You're dangerous. That's why we want to be connected all the time. I couldn't trust someone that doesn't want to be connected to the God, to the presence of the Lord. No way. And then we won't progress. God won't promote us. Why? Because we're to love his presence more than ours. <laughs> Amen. I'm going to say that again. We're to love his presence more than ours. If your presence is still love more than his, then you're disconnected. Matthew 24. The exodus, the exit us. In verse 29. 
Now, we've talked about this before, and I want you to know that the tribulation is seven years. And there's two sections. Each section of the tribulation is three and a half years. The first part of the tribulation is called tribulation. It'll be three and a half years. The second part of the tribulation is called great tribulation because it'll be the wrath of God. Amen? And according to prophetic word and interpretation, we should be removed in mid-tribulation. The exodus will be mid-tribulation. In verse 29, would you read it? Immediately after tribulation, you notice he doesn't say great tribulation. He says tribulation. So he's talking about after three and a half years of tribulation. Of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from heaven and the powers of, heaven, of the heavens will be shaken. Then the, sun, the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. So again, he will, they, he will be coming and they will see him in the heavenlies because he won't not touch the earth yet. Amen? Now I want to share something with you I was reading about tonight before I came here about a, a very old rabbi well known in Israel. And they followed his teachings and everything. Well known. He passed away. But he said that he was going to write the name of the Messiah down. And it wasn't to be read till after he was gone. Because he never preached on who the Messiah was. Because he was a well known rabbi. Anyways, he passed away. And he, there is a, a, a governmental official that is still in a coma right now. And he said that the Messiah will return when this gentleman dies. After he dies, he will, the Lord will return. And that gentleman hasn't died yet. And so when they opened up this folded letter and interpreted what he was saying, he said that the Messiah was called Yeshua. There was hundred, or there were hundreds of thousands of people at his funeral. <laughs> And uh, after his funeral and everything, they opened up this, and that Yeshua was the Messiah, who is Jesus. Well, it kind of blew everybody's mind, and they tried to disqualify it and discredit it and say that this wasn't it. And whatever. Well, they've, they have not discredited it, even though that they're trying to say it's not true. But it's pretty fo powerful for a, a rabbi, I mean, the guy must have been 99. You know. And uh, to leave that for his people so that they would know who the true Messiah was so that many could be saved. Amen? Amen. In verse 31, now the sign of Jesus will be in the air. He will come with power and great glory. And then it says in verse 31, and he will send his angels with a great sound of a what? Trumpet, fulfilling the feast of trumpets. And they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. This is called the gathering, the great gathering. Now learn this parable from the fig tree, which means Israel. When its branches have already become tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer is near. So you also, when you see all these things, know that it is near at the doors. Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. And again, this, he's talking about Israel becoming a nation in 1948. A generation is 70 years. That brings us to 2018. Does it mean that Jesus is going to return in 2018? Yes. It means he's going to start his approach. Does everybody understand it? In that he is going to begin to pour out his spirit. He's going to come through the body of Christ before he personally comes. Amen. So we know that right now it is beginning to happen. 
one of the things God's presence is beginning to do is invade our government. <laughs> that shows you right there. That's why he put Trump in office. To what? Fulfill the Feast of Trumpets. Is everybody okay? Glory to God. Okay, again, the fig tree, so that we're the generation. Jesus begins his entrance or approach by coming through the body of Christ for the world's largest final harvest, which America will lead. Amen. The word says that we are in the days of Noah and Sodom and Gomorrah. Actually, what God is doing right now is undoing the last eight years of a demonic reigns of Obama. He was an Obamanite. So we got here the days of Noah, which there was nothing but perversion and fornication and so forth. Sodom and Gomorrah the same way. Amen. His purpose, their purpose was to bring down the country in a 16-year plan. Obama did the first eight years. Now we got to rebuild the military and everything else and remove all of the ones that, um, that were anti-American. Uh, in all of our governments. And of course, uh, Jesse and uh, Ahab, Hillary and, and Billy, uh, perverse Billy boy, um, God prevented them from entering. Amen? Now we've got the area, you know, God, again, God leaves a remnant. He leaves witnesses. We talked about the two witnesses, and I'll talk about that in a minute more. But one of the things that we are in right now is what we call Joshua, because Exodus, the, the reach of final promised land, Moses was replaced by Joshua, amen, which Joshua was a representation of a Savior or Messiah, amen, Jesus. But he brought him to the promised land, didn't he, Amen. Of course, millions died before they got there because they were grumbling and complaining, even though they had private tailors and shoes were constantly being brand new all the time. They had everything brought to them. That's all you needed to do is follow the fire in the cloud. I mean, what the heck? But no. So we have Joshua and we have the Joseph right now. And if you recall... These two remnants that portrayed Jesus' character, one led to the promised land from the, with the exodus, and the other posi was positioned in the government for seven years of plenty and then seven years of famine. And again, I believe right now that Trump is uh, also a jo uh, Joseph and a Cyrus. Cyrus was, in fact, the uh, prime minister of Israel called uh, Trump, and the same character of King Cyrus, who was a rebuilder of the walls, who, uh, brought, who did, redid trade again and, and brought prosperity and everything else. And uh, Joseph was there at a specific time to help the Israelites. He infiltrated, God hit him, had to put him through a bunch of stuff, you know. He had him hidden in the prisons, then brought him out and gave him a prophetic word to expose. And when it was interpreted from the uh, Pharaoh, uh, he, Pharaoh put him in position. And so the, during the famine time, the, the people were able to get fed because of the seven years of plenty. Amen? In Matthew 25, would you go there? Matthew 25. And this is where we are right now, uh, where God is trying to awaken the body. That's why there is judgment in the house of God. And better, than, better judgment than wrath. Amen. In verse 1, Then the kingdom of heaven shall be like in ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom, which is a representation of those who were Repented and cleansed by the blood to become a virgin. 
Thank God it's got nothing to do with how you feel. Amen? Now, five of them were wise, five of them were stupid or foolish. Those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. In other words, they stayed connected. Amen? But while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight a cry was heard, Behold, the bridegroom is coming, go out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose, trimmed their lamps, and a foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, No, lest there should not be enough for us and you. But go rather, uh, go to, uh, rather to those who sell and buy for yourselves. And I want you to know, this parable is from Jesus. Amen. And he's telling them, nobody else can pay the price for your oil. You pay the price. It's your responsibility to be connected to the presence of God. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding, and the door was shut. And afterward, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. Open to us. Open to us. So uh, they obviously knew about Jesus. Amen? But Jesus recognizes Jesus. Jesus is looking for his presence in his people. Amen? But Jesus answered and said to him, Surely I say to you, I do not know you. Why did he not know him? Know them because they were disconnected from the presence of God. They became religious. Hey, they might have been connected to the word of God. Are you with me? But they weren't connected to the presence of God. That's why a lot of people can quote scriptures but still live an ungodly life. Amen? He says, so watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. Again, this is where we are about kingdom business. Must be first before personal business. We are the remnant of the hidden army to come out at such a time as this. We are warriors and servants to our king. We need to continue to break off all limitations and cut ourselves loose of all bondages. And that's by, so that we maintain the connection to the presence of God. Why? Because the anointing breaks every yoke of bondage, doesn't it? And we want to stay connected so that the power of the tongue is released as we decree and send forth the word of God. Again, we are the remnants and the witnesses right now. But when we're gone... That's it. Those who will miss the removal, the miss the exited, there will become many believers. Loads of them. And many who said that they were believers but were not connected to the presence of God. Amen? Now watch this. So, I'm going to go somewhere. Um... I'm going to go to Psalm 36. Psalm 36 in verse 1 through 4. Is everybody there? Let's speak it. An oracle within my heart concerning the transgression of the wicked. What does it say? There is no fear of God before his eyes. It's amazing. There's, it's amazing to me that there's no reverence to the Lord. When there's no reverence to the Lord, there's no relationship. There's no connection. And we see this all over. You see this on TV. You see this on news medias. You see this on people that mocking, all kinds of stuff. I mean, they just, they just speak whatever they feel like. There's no reverence at all. God is not in their thoughts or in their life. For he flatters himself in his own eyes when he finds out his iniquity and when he hates. The words of his mouth are wickedness and deceit. That's why they're called liars. He has ceased to be wise and to do good. He devises wickedness on his bed. And he sets himself in a way that is not good. 
and he does not hate evil. Amen? God calls these individuals wicked. No fear of God. Doesn't hate evil. They're liars and deceivers. And they plan wickedness because they're promoters of self, not God. And 2 Peter chapter 1. The Exodus. Second Peter chapter one. Starting at verse two. Is everybody okay? Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. As his divine power is given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness to the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue. By which have been given to us exceedingly great promises, precious promises, that through these you may be what? Partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Now, this is powerful. So what he's saying, only the divine nature escapes. Think about that. Because the divine nature is established by being connected to the presence of God and being aligned to the word of God. So the divine nature is the one that escapes. It exits the world, not the human nature. The human nature cannot get into heaven. Only the divine nature gets into heaven. Amen? That's why a lot of people are going to be get blown away when they're left behind. Still living according to human precepts. Still living the life of a humanite. Some of them are still connected to Obamanite. And the approvals of those things. Amen? Praise God. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Second Timothy chapter two and verse twenty one. Now even though that we have stepped into a seven year period of plenty, doesn't mean that God can't change it. Amen. He is God. <laughs> In verse 21, therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, that means latter sins, latter life, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified and useful for the master, prepared for every good work. Flee also youthful lusts, but pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace with those who call out on the, of the, or the Lord with a what? Pure heart. So we got to be careful because associations bring impartations. Amen. But avoid foolish and ignorant disputes, knowing that they generate strive. And the servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach, and patient. In humility, correcting those who are in opposition, if God, perhaps, will grant them repentance so that they may know the truth. And that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do his will. Wow. <laughs> Again, cleansing from the past will escape or exodus. Amen. And the only way you can not, not go to your past anymore is if you're connected to the present. When you're connected to the present, you live from the future to the present. Amen. You no longer, won't no longer live from the past to the present. Again, I, I, I could probably talk about this to the day we're let, we take out of here about being connected to the presence of God. I mean, you talk about vital. Vital. One of the things is you don't get revelation without being connected to the presence of God. And what does the word say? Without revelation, the restraints aren't there. You're no longer restraining the flesh. You're no longer restraining the old man. The old man is being cut loose and he starts taking over you. 
That's why the word says a little love and leavens a whole lump. It only takes one seed of compromise. But the important things, you must recognize it. That's why there's boundaries. We must recognize it. I'm not saying you're not going to step into it. I'm not going to say that you're not going to make a mistake. But the more you practice recognizing it, the less you'll do it. Amen? To where it finally comes there, you don't do it no more. Amen? Oh, hallelujah. hallelujah. First Thessalonians chapter 4. Now, let's get to the. First Thessalonians chapter 4. In verse 13. Is everybody there? Let's speak it together. But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. Those are the, they have fallen asleep. In other words, they've died in Christ. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him, those who sleep in Jesus. Why is he going to bring them with him? So that they can get a glorified body. He does it all at once. And it doesn't matter whether you're cremated or buried. He knows exactly where you be. He's God. <laughs> For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. This is representation of Moses. Why? Because what happened with Moses is God buried Moses. Then he sent an angel to go get Moses and bring him home. Amen? It's the same thing. So those who are in Christ will be returned they will get a glorified body just like Moses was raised from the dead and be taken home. For the Lord, and, and, and so, but we who are alive will be caught up with them. For the Lord himself will descend with, from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first, associated with the character of Moses, then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds, those who are alive, and meet the Lord where? Where? In the air. Amen. And thus shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Why? Because we will meet him in the air. The world will see him. That's what you're talking about in Matthew 24. That he will send out his angels and gather. That will be called the gathering. It's also known as the rapture. It's also known as the day of the Lord. Amen. Go to, um, let's go to chapter 5 while we're here. So again, we need to have revelation of the reality with no walls of bondages, but pure freedom. Pure freedom. Well, how do you get pure freedom? <laughs> we want to live with pure direction, which we talked about before. And that can only come with a pure connection with the presence of God. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 1. But concerning the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness so that this day should overtake you as a thief. You are all sons of the light and sons of the day. We are not of the night or the darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet of hope of salvation. For God did not appoint us for the wrath. Remember, the wrath of God is the Great tribulation. Amen? That's the last three and a half years. But to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or we sleep, 
we should live together with him. Therefore, again, comfort each other and edify one another just as you always do. It's also called the day of the Lord. It's removal of the righteous believers, isn't it? Amen? But again, we are not accounted for that last three and a half years of wrath as long as we are connected to the presence of God. It's important. Why? Because if you're connected to the presence of God, you, Jesus is in front of you and everything you do and make decisions. And you're always connecting and asking, Lord, what do you think? How do you want me to do this, Lord? You know? And when you make a mistake, sorry. You're quick to repent. Amen? Go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. So it will be the righteous church that will be removed. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1. Let's read it now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our what? Gathering. Now he puts it all together, doesn't he? And our gathering together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, or as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. Do you know that some of the places, some of these organiz religious organizations that already preached this has happened? Dumb. No connection. No revelation. No correct interpretation. Let no one deceive you by any means. For the day of the Lord will not come unless the falling away comes first. And the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? And now you know that what is restraining that he may be revealed in his own time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. And who is the he? Us. Us. We are the body of Christ. Amen. We are the ones that the presence, why? Because we carry the presence of God that is restraining complete takeover from the evil one. <clears throat> but once we are taken out of the way, which is mid-trib, wrath comes. There will no, be no more help. Let's just say that. It will be hell on earth. <clears throat> and then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will eventually consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. Now the coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish. Because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. For this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie. That's going to be one of the lies of the Luciferian agenda and the Democratic Party. The Libertarian Party and all these false religions. That they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. <clears throat> But we are bound to give thanks to God always for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God from the beginning chose you for salvation through what? Sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth to which he called you by our gospel for obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is powerful. Revelation chapter 11. <clears throat> Revelation 11. So we accounted for the wrath of God? No. Why? Because we're connected to the presence of God. Does everybody understand that? And because we're connected to the presence of God, the divine nature is expressed. In Revelation chapter 11. Is everybody there? Verse 1. 
Then I was given a reed like a measuring rod, and the angel stood saying, Rise and measure the temple of God, the altar, and those who worship there. But leave out the court which is outside the temple, and do not measure it, for it has been given to my, the Gentiles, and they will tread the holy city underfoot for 42 months. For how many months? 42 months. Now I want you to know that we are no longer Gentiles. Does everybody get it? So this is the unsaved. And I will give power to my two witnesses. And they will prophesy 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. So again, this is 42 months or two and a half years or three and a half years. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands standing before the God of the earth. And if anyone wants to harm them, fire proceeds from their mouth and devours their enemies. And if anyone wants to harm them, he must be killed in this manner. These have power to shut heaven so that no rain falls in the days of their prophecy. And they have power to turn waters to turn them to blood. Who had power to shut heaven? Elijah. Who had power to turn water to blood? Moses. And to strike the earth with all plagues as often as they desire. You talking about stuff happening. When they finished their testimony, the beast, the Nephilim, the fallen angel, that ascends out of the bottomless pit will make war against them and overcome them and kill them. And their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city, which is spiritually called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Then those who from the peoples, tribes, tongues, and nations will see their dead bodies. And they're going to celebrate like crazy. And they will see their dead bodies three and a half days. Hello. What does that represent? Three and a half years. And not allowing their dead bodies to be put into graves. So they're going to keep them out for three and a half days. Then those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them, making merry, sending gifts. To them it will be like Christmas. Xmas, I guess you might want to say. And send gifts to one another because these two prophets tormented those who dwell on the earth. What were they trying to do? Get their attention to get saved. Now, after three and a half days, the breath of life from God entered them, and they stood on their feet. Hello. And a great fear fell on all those who saw them. And they heard the loud voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here, that you and I are going to hear it too, because we're going home with them. And they ascended to heaven in the cloud, and their enemies saw them. Now, in the same hour, there was a great earthquake, and a tenth of the city fell in the earthquake. 7,000 people were killed, and the rest were afraid and gave glory to God in heaven. The second woe is passed. Behold, the third woe is coming. Now, I want you to know that this is called, this is the sixth trumpet. Has everybody got it? This is where the sixth trumpet will sound. And then it will start the seventh trumpet, which seven means what? Complete and perfect. Is everybody okay? So this will be the completion of the sixth trumpet. When the seventh trumpet sounds, you and I are out of here. This is going to be fulfilled. The seventh trumpet will sound. The two, the two prophets will be raised. The body of Christ will be taken also. They'll exit us. Revelation 12. Hallelujah. So right after that, people will enter the great tribulation. More restraint. Amen. Hallelujah. Now, in Revelation 12:13. Now when a dragon saw that he had been cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. But the woman was given two wings, 
of, gr of a great eagle. These two wings are considered Moses and Elijah, the two prophets. Does everybody get it? That she might fly into where? The wilderness to her place where she is nourished for times, time, time, times, and half time, which is three and a half years. From the presence of the serpent, like I shall be home in heaven. So the serpent spewed water out of his mouth like a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away by the flood. But the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened its mouth. Why? Because there was a great earthquake. And swallowed up the flood which the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. Now look at this. And the dragon was enraged with the woman, and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring. Why? Because we are gone. Who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Well, they're going to definitely keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ when they see the final sign known as the rapture, which we call the exodus. Amen? Oh, hallelujah. And I'm going to close at Hebrews 12. Glory, the Exodus, Hebrew. Is everybody okay? Anybody okay? Are you blessed? Are you getting this? Hebrews 12, verse 25. Hmm. Glory. Say that you see that you do not what? Refuse him who speaks. For if they did not escape who refused him who spoke on earth, much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him who speaks from heaven, whose voice then shook the earth, but now he has promised, saying, Yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. Now this, yet once more, indicates the removal of those things that are being shaken as things that are made, that the things which cannot be shaken may remain. There, since we have receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. For our God is a consuming fire. Amen. Praise God. Father, we thank you for your word. We are honored and blessed for revelation. Lord, let us not forsake connecting ourselves to your presence and aligning ourselves with your word so that we may be count worthy to escape your wrath, which is to come. In Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. amen. Praise God. Be blessed and stay dressed.